So welcome everyone to the last instalment of our career chat evenings. Um, tonight we're focusing on all things engineering. Um, as an introduction, my name's Karen and I am the co-op industry partner for engineering. I'm also joined tonight by Kay Carey, who is the head of the co-op program and also our industry partner for business. Uh, some of you might have seen her if you joined on Tuesday. Um, so similar to our other sessions uh, we've had this week, so business on Tuesday, like I said, and technology yesterday, this session will be recorded. Um, so links to all three sessions will be sent to everyone who's registered and also to your careers advisors. So no need to furiously jot down notes, um, but who's, who am I to tell you what to do? So if you want, go for your life. Um, in terms of an agenda for today, uh, for the next hour, although we may go a bit over depending on Q&A, We'll just chat through some key things to remember and consider when going about choosing your career or deciding what you want to do. Um, we'll talk about what engineering at UNSW looks like, including a quick overview of all the areas of specialization. And tonight you'll hear from a number of people. Um, so you'll hear from two representatives from one of our sponsor companies, Iberdrola Australia, which includes a video from Talia Nolan. And we'll also hear from Stephanie Easton, who's on our panel tonight. And then you'll also get a chance to hear from two of our final year co-op scholars. So Lauren Collin, who's studying mechanical engineering and also Isabella Notta Prieto, who's studying chemical engineering. I'll then give a quick overview of what the co-op scholarship looks like. Um, and then there's time for Q and A. So to kick us off. So some key things to remember about careers. You're at a point in your life where it's good to start thinking about these things and what you wanna do. I remember when I was in your shoes and the thought of figuring out what a career I want, uh, what career I wanted to look like was kind of kind of like the picture on the right, although I'd probably say a bit messier. Um, there are lots of options out there. And at first, this can definitely be somewhat confusing and or overwhelming. So some key things to remember about careers and what I've learned from my own so far is that there's definitely no black and white. So don't be constrained by traditional views. A particular job, a job description or a career path is never static. A career in any field from 10 years ago when I was in your shoes is so different to what it is today. When it comes to careers, there's definitely no right or wrong. So developing a career path takes a lifetime and you don't need to have all the answers now. There are a lot of options and that's something that you'll probably hear me say a lot tonight but just take it one step at a time assess your options and what i've learned is that it'll be okay as long as you make the choice that is best for you at the time and not for anyone else and when it comes to choosing a career destination there are always multiple ways to get there when you look around at people's careers there's rarely a linear line of progression if my slides want to work. So there's a great career ahead and you don't have to have everything figured out right now. You just need to figure out where you want to launch from. So some key things to consider when choosing a career are your talents. So what do you do well? Some talents or skills that you are naturally good at or what you've worked at being good at. There may be other talents that you are good at, but you might not know yet. So always be curious and also always give things a go. Be open-minded about the things that are around you. What do you think you might be good at and how could that be useful or even transferable in a career? And what are your values? So what's important to you? Is it doing a wide range of work? Are you happy with more repetitive tasks? Is it being more analytical or a space where you get to be more creative, being physically active or working in a corporate office? Do you want a stable nine to five job or are you more flexible with consulting hours and projects? It's also good to think about what are your interests? So what are you passionate about? Not what your parents, your siblings, your friends or anyone else is passionate about because at the end of the day, you are the one that will be doing the job, not them. So try and find what interests you. If you're not sure, just ask yourself, what are the things that you're naturally drawn to or things that make you curious, or take the time to figure it out. Remember, you have a whole career ahead of you. And lastly, what are the opportunities that are around you? What's available? What influences can you draw upon? Who can you talk to to get more information or just to even ask silly questions that probably aren't so silly? 
And did you meet someone who inspired you or did you read something that resonated with you? Be open to the opportunities around you and be curious and continually ask questions. So where to next? Once you've asked yourself all these questions, you have a lot of information um, to work with. So how do you go about working through all of that? If you need to find out more information, the best way to do it is ask more questions. I know, lots of information, lots of questions, overwhelming, it's all fine. Just lean on your network and look around on uh, LinkedIn. Talk to people about their experiences, lessons they've learned along the way. Do they have any contacts that could help you in your direction? I think what I've learned is that everyone has stories and from that, people have learned so much that it's just great to build a network that you can work off and like leverage and use all their learnings and experiences. Also get some life experience, get involved. That can be joining a sports team, volunteering your time for a community group, applying for casual work, just get some life experience and gain some skills. Whilst your study is important, the single focus will not do you any favours in the long run. There is a big emphasis by companies on well-rounded employees who can balance commitments, who have a wide variety of skills, who have varied interests and varied experiences. It's not just about whether you can do the job well, but it's who you are as a person or individual. Find out what you enjoy or don't enjoy and what you're good at and what you need to improve on. A variety of activities also looks great on applications. It'll provide you an ample supply of stories for you to tell people about your skills and interests. And eventually you'll build your bank of stories and examples that you can share for people who are in your shoes in the next five or 10 years. And also seek out more opportunities, go for them. So don't wait for opportunities to come to you. Be proactive in everything you do. Search for people you can meet and build connections with things that you can do to learn new skills, to broaden your knowledge or to gain just your more skills, 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 skills. And so during this process of exploration and decision-making and seeking advice and people telling you what you should and shouldn't do, plus all the things and noise that comes with that, it can definitely be overwhelming. So don't panic. You have lots of time because like I've said, developing a career path takes a lifetime. And you're starting this journey early and may gain some advantage as a result. You don't need to have all the answers now. And I'm going to keep saying it because it's true. <laughs> Remember to gather information on areas that interest you and gain life experience that will develop skills to help you choose a career direction or directions that you can launch from. There's no need to make one scroll into fast. There's no need to make one ultimate career decision and you don't need to have all the answers now. So new opportunities might open up. You might change your mind, change direction and drive off of your intended roadmap. And that's okay. It's actually very normal. Careers these days are very, uh, are rarely a linear uh, progression. Take it from someone who's changed companies and industries. You don't need to make one ultimate career decision. Remember, it's a journey. So for some of you, you may have already figured out that engineering is for you. It's your bread and butter. It's what you want to do. But for those who haven't decided or aren't sure what it involves, engineering is an occupation with extremely wide reach. It is a broad field that offers exciting career opportunities where you'll get the opportunity to be creative, to solve problems and explore how things work every day. So how can you decide or start deciding if engineering is for you? So if you're curious or constantly questioning the way things work, if you find yourself taking things apart and putting them back together, repairing machinery or electronic equipment, teaching yourself computer programming and enjoying problem solving in general, then engineering could be for you. So why engineering at UNSW? The UNSW Engineering Faculty is Australia's top engineering faculty with a strong international reputation and industry connections and is at the forefront of education, research and innovation. The faculty combines the world's best facilities and innovative research with an exciting and connected education experience. 
all engineering degree programs have a strong emphasis on design and problem solving. So from day one, you'll be involved in hands-on projects, collaborating with other students and problem solving. There are lots of types of engineering. So it may be a bit difficult for you at this stage to know where to start. I would definitely encourage you to do lots of research to find a degree that is best suited to your interests, your passions, your values, and things that you wanna pursue later in life. But I'll give you a quick overview of the specializations in engineering that we offer in um, co-op scholarships in. But as well, I wouldn't take my complete word for it because I, my background's not engineering. So I'll let the panel do some of the talking about that afterwards as well. So in terms of chemical engineering, you're looking at design, create and optimize systems and equipment in chemical, industrial, biological and environmental processes. Chemical product engineering has an emphasis on product design and technology. For example, new materials and technologies that can overcome high costs and scarcity to create value adding solutions. Electrical engineering encompasses research, design, development, manufacturing and management of complex systems for many different uses. Mining engineering deals with the extraction of natural minerals from the earth and the processing of those minerals into more user-friendly forms with minimal environmental impact. Civil engineering work looks at design, construct, manage, operate and maintain infrastructure that supports modern society. Environmental engineering focuses on identifying environmental problems and developing effective solutions. And then we have mechanical engineering, where mechanical engineers develop solutions to help mechanical processes and products. Petroleum engineering. So petroleum engineers work with oil or gas companies to design, test and implement efficient methods to extract petroleum products from the earth and sea floor. Photovoltaics and solar energy engineering, so the manufacture and use of solar cells, which capture and convert sunlight into electricity. Renewable energy explores the best ways to make use of renewable energy technologies, such as solar thermal systems, photovoltaics, wind and biomass. And finally, we have material science engineering, which is the foundation for creating high performance materials, such as metals, ceramics, polymers and composites. So as you can really see from just that snapshot slide, there is such a wide range of work that you can go into or things that you can learn from engineering. I think the starting point is figuring out which ones interest you or what you think you want to pursue a career in. And like I said before, do your research. Now to hand over to the experts. Um, so you'll hear career journeys from four different people. The first, you'll hear um, a video from Talia Nolan, who's the manager um, in market modeling and policy at Iberdrola Australia. You'll then hear from Stephanie Easton, who's general manager, operations control center for Iberdrola Australia. And it is quite good to know that they were both UNSW alumni as well. And then you'll hear from Lauren Cullen, who's a mechanical engineering scholar, and Isabella Notta Pietro, who's our chemical engineering scholar. So if you bear with me for just one second, so we can do our switch of technology. I don't think the sound's coming through, unless that's just me. Nope, I'm seeing Kay move and try and tell me too. So, so can you see the video, but not here? Okay, let's try again. And... Hi there. My name's Talia Nolan, and I'm the Manager of Market Modelling and Policy at Iberdrola Australia, where I look at the future of our energy market and how we will transition to a clean energy future. Iberdrola Australia is one of the largest producers of renewable energy in Australia. We own wind farms, battery energy storage and gas-fired generators to provide green energy to our customers. I studied a Bachelor of Renewable Energy Engineering and a Bachelor of Commerce majoring in Economics from the University of New South Wales. I'm here today to provide my insights into engineering and how it's influenced my career and the roles that I've had. 
So while studying engineering, I was introduced to the electricity market, which is a large electrical infrastructure system that has to obey physical constraints, overlaid with economic decision making, which happens every five minutes to a long term investment time frame. The electricity market was fascinating to me because it's something that we interact with day to day, whether it's charging our phone, turning on a light bulb or exporting solar from our homes. It also provides the largest opportunity we have to decarbonize our economy. However, I didn't start off straight away in my role. I've had a variety of different roles, ranging from you know, working in a startup where you sort of tackle anything and everything you can. I've had technical engineering roles where I've uh, worked with pumps and generators, measuring efficiency and designing systems. I've also worked in large corporate companies as a consultant where I've worked with governments and provided advice on how to design policies to incentivize decarbonization and to incentivize the uptake of new technologies. I've also worked with companies in helping them uh, identify through their existing operations how they can move to zero emissions and help them invest into renewable energy. I believe engineering has provided me with not only a technical skill set of measuring and modeling and designing, but also a soft skill set of teamwork and critical thinking and problem solving, which I've been able to use in a variety of different roles and it's opened up a lot of opportunities for me. My current role as manager of market modeling and policy means that I'm a key person in our business thinking about the future. I have broad engagement across the business in order to build up our view on how we believe the electricity market will evolve. This means that I'm thinking about key assumptions around, you know, how many electric vehicles will we have in 2025 and 2030? You know, will households continue to install rooftop solar at the same rates that they currently do? And will hydrogen be used to decarbonise our industries? And if so, how much electricity is needed to do so? Another part of my role is to contribute to policy design and how that will influence the electricity market in the future. Again, it's thinking through how changes in policy will influence decision making by consumers, just like yourselves, and by us as Iberdrola Australia, as an investor and a producer of energy. So maybe some of my career highlights. Um, I think I get a career highlight when I can make us or put us on a pathway to reduce emissions and tackle climate change. It has come, I guess, in the form of seeing business cases I've delivered turning into physical assets producing clean energy. So that's like solar and battery and green hydrogen production. It has also come in the way of changing our electricity market. So last year I submitted a rule change to our market commissioner to introduce a market for fast frequency response. And this will now be a market in 2023 and will help us transition to a higher penetration of renewable energy and to prepare us for the closure of large fossil fuel generators. So my advice for anyone thinking about engineering. Well, firstly, I guess it's the only, I guess it's just the beginning of decarbonizing our economy. Uh, so there'll be plenty of en interesting engineering challenges going forward in this field. Secondly, make sure that as you're learning your technical skills, that you continue to develop your communication skills as broader game engagement across a business can mean you're trying to explain your ideas or findings to a diverse background of people. And lastly, something that I have learned is don't worry about not knowing everything. Engineering is such a, a broad and huge range of knowledge and it's why we work in teams to share and use strengths of each other to overcome challenges. So please reach out if you have any further questions, but otherwise, good luck with your studies and I hope to see you in industry one day. All right, alrighty. I'll pass over to Stephanie. Thanks, Karen. So as some of you would have guessed, I work at the same company as Talia and we actually had a really similar, I guess, academic background. So we both studied the same double at University of New South Wales. Back when we were studying renewable energy engineering, it was still probably thought of one of the newer degrees to be added to uh, the engineering school at UNSW. 
And I think we discovered a lot about what engineering actually was, whilst also kind of learning about this new technology that in some ways is still cutting edge and, and you often are in a bit of an innovation state of mind when thinking about it. But nonetheless, Carly and I have both ended up at Iberdrola Australia. And I think there's a lot of similarities in what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, but also a lot of differences. And I also think that we probably took um, slightly separate journeys through university. So if I'm thinking about how I actually ended up at a renewable energy company, it was on a straight path. And I think the comments being made uh, introducing this session are really, really key, that that openness to learning and, and kind of not being set on the path that you're going to take is really key. For me, I think that I had a clear idea that I wanted to study renewable energy. It was something I was really passionate about. And that was a culmination of really what I'd learned uh, through my high school experience. Decarbonisation, you know, why do we need to emit to generate electricity, electricity is just making something spin and kind of having all these curiosities sparked is what got me into renewable energy. But I didn't know why well, I thought I knew where I was gonna be at the end of that six year journey. But as my education continued to grow and I got to learn more about the specialization, the systems that support electricity, the ways of problem solving, uh, just all the different sectors of industry that exist of government and policy making, uh, that learning journey of university itself just opened up so many more kind of areas of further curiosity for me. And that really is how a career I think is shaped is, is obviously you, you want to make an income, but to me, being able to just continue to follow curiosity is key. And university will set you up with a, you know, it's continued learning from what you're doing at high school, but it's also teaching you a new way to, to kind of follow those curiosities and learn. In engineering, I think the additional benefit is you're really taught to be a problem solver. And so the careers that that can apply to are very wide ranging. If I think about the graduates that uh, I finished university with, they've ended up in really broad range of sectors from the really technical to something that you wouldn't even think of an engineer stepping into, but they really are problem solvers, um, I think at the, end of, at the end of a university career. To kind of understand what I do on a day-to-day -day basis then. So where Talia gets to kind of come up with all these great ideas of what our business is going to invest in, the types of technologies that uh, kind of fit within, within the assets that we own. She's really thinking about Iberdrola as a company. We want to be the type of electricity utility. So big electricity utilities, if you, if you want to kind of say, who am I trying to be equivalent to? It's your AGLs, Energy Australia, Origin Energies. They're companies that own um, utility scale energy or electricity generation assets, and then they contract to customers. So Iberdrola is one of those types of companies. But what we're doing is we want to make sure that we have really low emissions generation technology. So we're always thinking about, well, what does the electricity grid as a whole need to look like if we're going to have higher levels of renewable energy? So it's a really outward looking type of role. But my role kind of sits at the pointy end of things. So Talia and her team come up with some great ideas. As a business, we execute them. And I get the, the fortunate job of saying, great, we've built the batteries, we've built these new wind farms. Steph, go operate them. To operate assets in the electricity market, this kind of a real technical point of view of wind turbines, they need to generate, they need to be mechanically sound, electrically sound. You need to understand how they're interacting with the electricity system. It's a rapidly changing system these days as we're retiring emissions intensive generation and replacing it, uh, not necessarily with like for like new renewable or lower emission generation. So there's a nice technical problem there, but we also have quite an economic problem, which is uh, you always want to do things low cost. So what we have in Australia is uh, it's a spot market and it's actually a really volatile market. So part of my job is actually running a trading function within our business. And it's a trading function which bids into the market every five minutes and then has to control all of our electricity generators in response to kind of the price outcomes and say constraints on the transmission network and things like that. That means that if I think about my typical day, uh, it's hard to say, when am I being an engineer? When am I being a people manager? When are we just being problem solvers, dealing with crises versus doing analytics? Every day is going to be different. We work in a really dynamic environment in electricity, and it's the thing that has really uh, drawn me to my career path. It's something that I love in terms of being able to uh, think on your feet. You need to make decisions with limited information. Uh, you don't always have the time to sit there and make sure you're really optimising your test is 
as a problem solver, uh, you have to solve this problem, but you're going to have limited information. So uh, that's the type of work that I found myself in. And I really, really enjoy it because at times you get to take a step back and you can understand how this kind of real time, real time work in electricity is feeding into a, a larger step that we're making as a country towards decarbonisation. If I think about some of my career highlights, they relate exactly to that, which is um, we've had new assets come into our business or we've made really kind of significant changes in our strategy. And leading my team, it's kind of been, hey, Steph, in a couple of months, this big change is going to happen. And it can seem monumental, but working with the, you know, the team that I uh, manage is uh, heavily made up by engineers from a really diverse range of disciplines, some with double degrees, uh, others without. We also have team members who might have finance or science backgrounds. But ultimately, we kind of get, you know, there's a big change coming. How are you going to prepare for it? And you're breaking it down into small problems. You're kind of all trying to think quite outside the box. Have we thought through every single aspect of what could go wrong and started to prepare for it? Have we got all of our systems in place? And you end up thinking more than just, we're not just sitting there thinking, how does a wind turbine work? We're thinking, how does our business work? And when we pull those types of you know, step changes off, it's really, really rewarding. Um, so if I were to give anyone advice in terms of going into engineering and thinking about what can come out of it, it was really hard for me to make tangible sometimes um, you know, that, that change that could happen whilst I was studying. I was going into renewable energy engineering because I was going to build wind farms, but I thought that I was going to be there with a spanner in my hand or I was going to be sitting in CAD designing components. And it's not where I've ended up at all, but um, you know that that willingness to learn and to pay attention to kind of understand that bigger picture and really take advantage of all the different minds and ideas, both in your colleagues but also your tutors and lectures and just the resources available at, at university. I think studying engineering, you you really get um, a good foot in the door to a really broad career path. And the opportunities are there to kind of pursue that in many different directions. And I think once you kind of get the groove of engineering, uh, studying engineering, you can start to understand where they may be. I definitely would recommend um, starting to try and make those networks. And there's lots of organic ways. And I think at university, there's also a lot of opportunities presented to make those networks from something as simple as attending kind of, you know, your, your school's barbecue once a month. You'll meet people who've had industry experience and they can connect you. So there's lots of really organic ways to make those connections. And I think that's really important. Um, and I think just generally keeping an open mind. As a uh, co-op sponsor, Iberdrola Australia, whenever we get new members into our business, particularly those who don't have as much industry experience, we can always tell it's going to be a good match when they're really curious, when they're really open to learning, really open to kind of asking questions about why does that work this way? and putting that system view together. Because I think understanding systems is, is one of the key things that you learn to do as an engineer. Thank you, Stephanie, for that. Uh, we'll move on to oh, Lauren. Perfect. Let me just slide this. There we go. Oh. Great. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lauren. I'm a fifth year mechatronics engineering co-op scholar, and I want to share a little bit about um, my background and my engineering degree so far. So I finished school down in Melbourne. Um, I went to a science school, so already I had a bit of an understanding that I was really into my physics, my maths, and um, at that time I was um, doing some solar, um, solar cell work, which I really enjoyed. So already engineering felt like an obvious match, which I was very lucky to already have that understanding because breaking it down even just to engineering can be a challenge um, at, at the core. So, I knew that I wanted to change cities. So I jumped online and, and Googled sort of every uni in Australia and what sort of um, scholarship or sponsorship um, options there were out there. And um, there was UNSW Co-op. And by the time I attended the um, interview weekend, 
Um, fell in love with the campus. It's all on one block. You have the music building near the elect, like the engineering buildings, et cetera. And I really like that community feel. So a couple months later, um, mum dropped me off in Sydney and, and there I was to start um, my five-year degree. So um, the beauty of it was that um, I had the financial support and as a bonus, as a 17-year-old, having three internships lined up was a bit of a dream. So how come um, mechanical? So I said I study mechatronics, but mechatronics falls under the School of Mechanical Engineering alongside with aerospace and manufacturing. And as a result, I chose that um, because of how broad it was. And I wasn't exactly sure at the time um, which specialty I wanted to go down. And I thought that was a, a great fit. So my game plan was to sign up to as many things as possible and meet as many people, um, not from a place of resume, but purely because I had no friends and, I was quite, and I'm quite a curious person. So I joined things like the mechanical engineering first year camp, which I then came back to the following year as a camp leader um, with the same campies that I'd met the first year. Um, some societies, um, a robotics competition where we, we fought two robots together and um, it was good fun and also um, soccer. So um, the UNSW football club for a few years. Um, that brings me on to my second year, which is the time where um, you do your first co-op placement. So I went to Telstra for six months and I'd never worked in a corporate environment. Um, I'd, I'd never stepped foot in such a big building before. And I just absorbed, absorbed, absorbed for six months. Obviously, I didn't have the some of the technical skills that um, some of the colleagues that had been there for 20 years knew, but um, I was able to help in, in other ways. I brought some of my coding in that my first year course had taught me to build some tools and um, spent had a great time with the team which actually led me to switch to mechatronics because I found that I really enjoyed the electrical and computer science elements of my first two years so in a way that was already progress in terms of finding my feet and my specialty so then third year, I felt quite settled in. Um, I'd, I'd narrowed down my involvement just to a couple um, societies or projects that I was really passionate about, uh, one of which was RoboGal. So we jumped around to high schools and primary schools and um, ran robotics workshops for young girls. And I just love the team and, and also the presenting, public speaking and helping the, um, the younger students. Um, Third year was also a little bit more challenging as well. Things ramp up. So I liked having a more um, refined scope of, of things that I was involved in. And this brings me on to fourth year. So as part of the co-op program, fourth year is two six months internships. So at the end of your fourth year, you have done a year and a half of industry experience, which is amazing. So the flexibility of it was great. I was able to go back to Melbourne and worked out over a course of the year what I liked and didn't like about um, the experience. So I was at FM Global, which is an engineering insurance company. I was in the engineering department, uh, went on site, developed risk report, analyzed um, natural hazard risks, et cetera. And that was actually a nice break from university. Getting to spend a year there really helped me integrate into the company. So, so then over the summer, um, the words consulting and startups had been thrown around since day one. And as an engineer, you have that flexibility where you could sort of end up anywhere, like Stephanie said. So I headed over to Deloitte for a few months and learned all about consulting um, and what I like and didn't like about it. I just wanted to get the final bit of understanding um, to really cover all the bases and as a result, help me progress my um, career. So this brings me on to my fifth and final year, which is this year, which is thesis year. 
So my sponsor company from last year when I was down in Melbourne, FM Global, um, I was lucky enough to be sponsored by them to do a research thesis. So I expanded one of the projects that I worked on last year and I'm now modeling batteries and battery packs and looking at their fire risks. So when a fire starts, how does it spread and how can we mitigate or minimize that risk? Which has been awesome to jump back to the team, get some feedback, improve the model and feel like my project is will be beneficial. Um, Otherwise, I had no direct societies when I came back to universities or extra involvement. I had a bit of time on my plate, but actually one of the um, programs at UNSW that I was involved in, um, their staff member reached out to me on LinkedIn and said, hey, I joined a startup. Um, we take imaging, we take images in space from our own satellites. Um, do you know anything about the space industry? Are you interested um, etc. So I now work part time in a space in a space industry company, which um, I never thought I would dip my toes in aerospace. I started as mechanical, and um, I have absolutely loved it. I, I told the team I don't think my I, I'm not sure how my skills are in terms of technical aerospace knowledge, but I quickly realised that the skills I developed from other experiences. I mean, in a startup environment, you're you're running around doing all kinds of jobs. So um, I do feel um, quite helpful, which is great. And I've learned so much and I've really fallen in love with the space industry um, and the, the startup space as well. So that's a little bit of where I am now. I'm, I'm wrapping up university in December and um, looking back, I can definitely say my first few years helped a lot, even though I thought I was treading water and a little bit lost and all over the place in terms of my career direction, all these things accumulated to working out my current path and, and have gotten me where I am. Even if I hadn't met um, theatre networking or at, at that pitch fest, I wouldn't have ever received the LinkedIn message, which has now gotten me my job. So, um, so what's next? Well, next year I'll, 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 I'll kickstart my career somewhere to be confirmed, but um, I feel like wherever I end up, I'll, I'll be um, comfortable and confident with um, beginning my um, engineering journey. So thanks so much. Thanks, Lauren. I might switch over to Isabella. Great. Thanks so much, Karen. So yeah, hi, everyone. My name's Isabella, and I'm a fifth year chemical engineering co-op scholar in the same year as Lauren. And tonight, I'll be sharing a bit about my journey in engineering and also my career so far. So why, why engineering? I guess nearing the end of year 12, unlike Lauren um, and similar to Karen, I was super confused about what I wanted to study. I'd taken a really broad range of courses, which included science and maths, but also some humanities courses such as Latin and English, which I really enjoyed. At the same time, I knew what I was passionate about, which was the environment and sustainability. And I knew that I wanted to make a career for myself in, this, in a related field. I was particularly interested in the connection between industry and environmental challenges and the opportunities to improve industrial practices in order to produce goods and services that we use every day with less energy, waste and raw materials. Rather than approaching degree selection as finding a course where I'd like the subjects, I instead adopted an approach of looking at jobs and industries I could see myself working in the future and then backtracking to identify degrees and opportunities like the co-op program that could get me there. I ultimately landed on chemical engineering as I saw that it would enable me to work on the environmental challenges such as energy usage and waste production that I was passionate about while combining my interests in maths, science and the humanities, because yes, engineering does include a lot of humanities elements as engineering intersects with people each and every day. And you also have to write a lot of research reports. I guess there's two key insights from this stage. First is to find your why. Before selecting your degree or applying for co-op, I think it's really valuable to interrogate what drives you and what you're passionate about. For me, it's addressing environmental and social inequalities. For you, it could be the same, or it could be improving people's lives, decarbonizing the energy grid, or increasing accessibility to digital services. 
The second thing is to plan and select your degree, considering what you want to be doing in five or 10 years. What type of career do you see yourself doing? And orient yourself around this. As you'll th see throughout my co-op experience, my career ambitions have certainly changed with time. By, but by selecting a degree that aligns with my overarching goals, passions and interests, I've been able to both stay motivated and always enjoy what I'm doing. So in terms of my co-op journey, my first placement was at the end of second year at Era Polymers, which was a company that produces polymers or plastics. I was a research chemist in the research and development department. It was a lab-based role where I was responsible for developing new polymer products with typical daily tasks, including testing new materials, conducting physical and mechanical testing, and managing multiple research and development projects simultaneously. This was a really valuable and important place me, placement for me from a career point of view, as prior to this, I'd always intended to pursue an industry-based PhD after university, as I wanted to design novel chemical processes to produce goods and services using fewer resources and energy. Through this placement, however, I realised that I didn't really enjoy being in the lab or doing R&D. I'm also quite clumsy, frequently coming home with large amounts of polymer all over my pants, so realised that perhaps a PhD in research wasn't suited for me. At the same time, I realised that I really enjoyed managing multiple projects at the same time, problem solving and having the opportunity to always learn new things. This then takes us to the second placement, which was in the first half of last year at Lion, one of Australia's biggest beverage manufacturing companies. I was engaged in a site-based role as a process improvement engineer at the largest brewery, Tui's, where we produced over 100 swimming pools of beer per year. Might have been a dream, however, I'm actually gluten intolerant, so I couldn't, have, couldn't even consume any of the product that I was producing every, any, each and every day. Regardless, I really enjoyed this placement and this role saw me managing projects to construct new equipment, uh, to um, implement new equipment on the site, monitoring the performance of equipment and just generally getting down and dirty with the plan. You could often find me testing valves on a Friday afternoon to identify which were needing repairing for the following week. I also had lots of opportunities to develop professionally in this role. For example, I spoke on a panel with the company CEO and produced a virtual video tour um, of the site for the engineering faculty, which if you decide to pursue chemical engineering, you will have to watch many, many times as it's now been implemented in each and every course, which is unfortunate for me. From a career point of view, there are also some really important learnings. I worked out that I enjoyed working as an engineer, particularly on projects related to sustainability and improving energy efficiency. At the same time, I found that making improvements at the site level was very gratifying. I also realized that I really wanted to work in a role where, where I was able to make change across many companies and industries rather than a single site. My final placement was at the end of last year at Safe Work New South Wales, which is the government agency responsible for regulating work health and safety. I was placed in the team responsible for regulating major hazard facilities, which are pretty much places that could harm lots of people or do lots of damage if something went wrong. Due to COVID, this was a work from home role, work from home role which whilst a different experience was also very rewarding and valuable. I guess typical daily tasks included writing reports about the risk posed by different facilities, project management, the development of new digital tools for my team, and also, uh, I guess, less technical tasks. For example, I organised, facilitated and presented at an industry forum with over 60 safety professionals. I also had the opportunity to be part of a surge workforce for COVID grants, showing the diversity of experience one can gain from both engineering and co-op placements. Like my previous placements, my role and the tasks I was doing were very much driven by me and my career goals, with my sponsor meeting with me prior to the placement to determine what I hoped to gain from the experience. From a career point of view, this role was really instrumental as it sparked an interest in public sector work and the role that engineers can play in contributing to policy and regulation. This in turn uh, motivated my ambition to apply for the Global Voices Scholarship, which the UNSW Co-op Office offers. 
I was lucky enough to secure this scholarship, which enabled me to attend the Youth G20 Summit in Indonesia only a few weeks ago, in which I was responsible for working with delegates from over 20 other countries to develop policy proposals to the world's most pressing environmental challenges, such as climate change and water scarcity, that will be delivered directly to the leaders of the world's 20 biggest economies. Through this program, I've also had the opportunity to work on and develop a policy proposal for the Australian government, therefore gaining experience with policy de development, which is not something that many people would appreciate, uh, typically associate with engineering. I'm now doing my thesis on novel ways to produce industrial chemicals using renewable energy. I'm also about to finish my engineering degree and looking to go into environmental and sustainability consulting to, to enable me to combine my passion for the environment with my desire to always learn new things and work across multiple industries. I guess reflecting on this overall experience in both the co-op program and engineering so far, I think there's three key takeaways. Firstly, a career in engineering opens up a really diverse range of career opportunities. As my diverse career placements and attendance at an overseas multilateral forum have shown, engineering is not one thing, but rather enables you to pursue many different career paths that align with your goals, interests, and passions. Secondly, it's good to have career goals, but these will likely change, and that's okay. My career goals have changed significantly throughout my co-op experience, as each placement has changed my perspective on what I want to do in the future. It's important to be open to and embrace this change as you learn about yourself, but at the same time, having a general plan for where you want to be in the future enables you to set yourself up for the next step. And finally, focus on the why, not the what. I alluded to this previously, but working out what drives you is crucial in crafting a study and career pathway that you enjoy and that you find meaningful. This why can then provide a sort of guiding light for you in your career journey. Thanks. Over to you, Karen. Thanks, Isabella and Stephanie and Lauren, and also a virtual thank you to Talia, um, just for sharing your journeys and your key takeaways. I think from listening to you all speak, I have four key takeaways from what you guys have said. The first is be a lifelong learner. Be curious about what you're learning and be innovative with your problem solving. The second is that people matter. In your career, you will always be working with people, so build your networks and leverage from them as much as you can. The third is, um, is to be curious because constant, the only constant is change. So learn to be agile. And the fifth is just to be, oh, sorry, I have my numbers written down wrong. So let's just rewind. And the fourth <laughs> is to just be kind to yourself as I am right now for not being able to count. Um, you don't need to have all the answers right now. So we move on just to give you a quick overview of the Co-op Scholarship Program. So one great vehicle for your engineering journey um, is the Co-op Scholarship Program. Um, it is a UNSW career development program uh, for high achieving, well-rounded students who are passionate about pursuing a career in a particular industry um, or field. It's offered across a wide range of areas, across business, engineering and technology. And like some of the students have said tonight, um, it offers students up to 18 months industry experience at three sponsor companies before graduation. There's a big focus on leadership and professional development training, as well as networking opportunities, whether that's with your peers or professionals. And as well, there's financial support um, of 19,600 per annum over four years. But I think one of the main key takeaways, especially from being able to speak to students in the co-op program, is that co-op scholars also have a lot of fun along the way, whether that's social gatherings, helping form friendships and networks that extend across the university with um, sponsor companies, as well as you know, alumni often tell us that these friendships last a long time. So 2023 applications are now open and they close on the 30th of September. Before we start diving into Q&A, um, feel free to put a, a question in the box. I might just hand over to Kay just to um, mention anything that I have potentially missed. I don't think you've missed anything, Karen. I think the um, I think between uh, you and the the speakers has been really, really very complete. Um, just 
a couple of things. Um, yet, yeah, please put your questions in the chat so we can try and organize them or in, Q, in the Q&A section. Um, and we'll try and get through as many questions as we possibly can. Um, the other general things, if we don't answer your question tonight, please be aware that um, that there's always someone to talk to in the co-op office. So if you have questions that aren't answered, don't be afraid to give us a call and we'll, um, we can answer them. Also, uh, University Open Day is on the 3rd of September uh, and we certainly will have lots of students available at that uh, during that event uh, and students speaking at that event uh, so that you can come and ask questions as well. And of course, that's in conjunction with all of the faculty that are there and all of the other um, exciting things that you can do at UNSW. So um, in the next little while, there are a whole lot of things that you can do uh, to advance your knowledge about degrees, about opportunities, um, and about extracurricular things that you might want to do at university, because I think that's the other message everyone has said. Um, study is important, but balance is perhaps as important, if not more important. And uh, in addition to developing your technical skills at university, we in particular through the co-op program are absolutely focused on you developing your professional skills, your social skills, um, your networks and your, and your mentoring um, relationships. So yeah, you've got a whole plethora of things to think about and develop. Um, so coming and checking all those things out uh, on, uh, and September the 3rd is a good thing to do. The other thing is once you register, uh, if you are interested in co-op, um, if you register uh, and start an application, then you're on our radar and we will invite you to lots of other opportunities to speak with students. We have various other sort of application chats, interview chats, et cetera, planned between now and the end of the year. And we certainly invite any applicants or any people interested in applying who've started an application uh, to those things. So that's just a bit more about where you can get more information. Uh, but first and foremost, I think you should use the resources that are sitting right here in the panel right now. And if you have burning questions, please um, put them in the chat so we can answer them, yeah? Thanks, Kay. I might just switch over so then it's official that Q&A has started because the slide's there. Um, I think, Kay, you might be typing an answer to one, but it might be good to throw that one out um, live. So the question is just around, um, can someone pursue a scholarship mm -hmm. after a gap year from the end of high school? Um, yeah, well, if that's thrown to me, then I would absolutely <laughs> say, yes, of course you can. Um, and in fact, um, Gap years can sometimes be extremely valuable in, in getting spending time getting your head around where you want to go and what you want to do. Um, so, um, however, you do need to apply uh, for the scholarship the year that you want to study. So, in other words, um, if you want to take a gap year, you would apply uh, for the 2024 co-op scholarship and you compete in that cohort of students, yeah? So um, uh, you can take up to two years of gap uh, before you apply, before you come back and, and apply for a co-op degree, uh, but you must apply for the year that you will start university and compete in that cohort of students. So yeah, absolutely. Great, thanks, Kay. And if anyone has any particular questions for our panelists specifically, feel free to also put that in the chat. Um, we have a question from students just asking around the number of scholarships offered um, per year for a particular degree or area. So this generally um, varies year on year. It depends on the number of sponsor companies that look to sponsor a particular cohort, um, but we will give extra information on the interview briefing day if you um, are successful for an interview in terms of the number of positions available and who those companies are. Um, and then it's also good to just have a look on our website as well for a list of sponsors. Um, and that's uh, been recently updated. So you can have a look just to see it, the different kinds of companies that are there. Um, I might throw back to Kay again, <laughs> um, just around double degrees and if students are able to do double degrees with the co-op scholarship? Um, uh, the answer is yes, uh, but within certain constraints. Um, in co-op, you need to pick, uh, because the co-op degree is offered in a 
um, in A major, A specialization. So you do need to pick your specialization for co-op right from the beginning. Um, because that you're apply, you'll apply for a co-op scholarship in chemical engineering, in in um, in um, industrial chemistry, or in uh, data science and decisions, or or uh, whatever. So you do need to make a decision on your specialization, your first specialization, right in the beginning. Um, uh, however, I think the the uh, the the students and the sponsors have certainly. Um, talk to you about how broad that uh, those degrees um, can be just in and of themselves. And of course, you're going to get broad and deep experience from your placements. Um, however, a number of engineering students do manage to do um, uh, double degrees. Um, and uh, the, the basic principle here is we are happy for you to think about a double degree or come and talk to us about a double degree. Once you've finished your first year of university, and your first placement and done those things successfully. Um, and so um, once that's done, and uh, then you can talk to us, you could talk to us about doing a double degree. Um, engineering degrees are very full degrees, and therefore um, it might it might imply, it might mean that it takes you a little bit longer to complete your degree. Your scholarship is your scholarship. It finishes when it finishes, it's for four years. You can then apply for a fifth year honours scholarship in engineering, um, but then the scholarship finishes if your double degree takes you a little bit longer. Um, but what we typically find uh, is that certainly the co-op office and the sponsors in particular programs are uh, happy to endorse a double degree if it's going to build your skill sets and your capabilities for, for a career direction that you're passionate about. Uh, but it is it does come with conditions. It is possible though. Thanks, Kay. I might throw over to Isabella and Lauren. Um, so the question is, how much of an edge or advantage has the co-op given you in confidence, technical skills or knowledge that I assume that you wouldn't think you would have gotten if you didn't pursue co-op? I'm happy to jump in. Um, yeah, no, I think it's actually been super valuable. And I think it does give you an edge, um, particularly with regard to the industry placements and all the, also the preparation for or the industry placements. So the co-op office doesn't, I guess, just like throw you into your first placement. Rather, there's like workshops in first year and second year to kind of prepare you for that. So we, there's a camp where you kind of focus on developing leadership skills. Uh, there's opportunities to get involved with like co-op society and also workshops on kind of excel skills and those sorts of things and definitely going into my first placement I recognized uh, the benefits of those for example a lot of my first role was on excel um, and because I had that training through the co-op program I was really able to I guess make the most of that and um, show my skills at the same time I think having that experience in the industry gives you an edge both within university and also looking beyond university because you have the experience of kind of applying your knowledge um, and applying the theory to practice and gaining that industry experience and also those, I guess, more soft and professional skills such as communication, uh, which is so crucial in any profession. That's not to say you can't get them without the cult program. You know, you definitely can get involved in clubs and societies um, and there's ways to gain them through industry placements. But um, I think it's, yeah, it's safe to say that it does give you a really competitive edge um, and also just really complements the kind of theoretical elements you learn in the university setting. Might add a couple of things that came to mind, but Bella covered all the basis. Maybe in regards to the first placement, um, you're just in second year, which which often you're, for engineering, you have to complete 60 days of industry experience. And you'll notice that the, the people around you are, are you know, um, trying to get it done in fourth, third, fourth year at the very end, and it can be hard to lock something in. So to already have six months under your belt heading into, th into third year um, is a big advantage. And the second thing is being in that cohort of co-op students um, is, a, is has been awesome because uh, they're very like-minded and will often want to do projects or um, extracurricular things or create social sport teams um, at you know in, in this immediate um, cohort of friends that you've made because you meet day two of o week so 
the friend side and the opportunities that that opens up are also a big advantage of being part of this community. Great. Thank you both. I'm going to stick with you two. Um, and one of the questions is what kinds of things make or what would do you think as part of your application process um, made you sort of stand out? Or I guess what are the typical things that an, would make an individual stand out in their application? Um, in the application, I've, I've found that I talked about the few things that I was really passionate about and um, somewhat shared my skills and um, the, whatever the question was asking through an anecdote, through a, a story or a, a strong example um, of, of something I'd been involved in. And, it, and, and the people I've talked to about what they put in the application, if it's a technical question, it doesn't necessarily need to be um, a, a project you did um, in that subject, in your stream, et cetera. It can be something far-fetched. It can be some um, extracurricular. It can be if you're really passionate about music, um, leadership demonstrated through band or et cetera. Um, but you'll, you'll often find that you, it's really easy to write if you really believe in your answer and are sharing something you're very interested in. Um, quite a broad answer, but but don't be shy to share your, um, your interests. There's no um, correct answer. If anything, you want to stand out. So um, show your quirk, show your niche, and that'll really resonate with the team who are reading all these applications. Yeah, I think just building on that, like while some people already may be doing things related to engineering like coding or being involved in projects with solar or something, uh, many of you likely haven't. And I think that don't let that stop you applying or thinking that engineering isn't for you. Like prior to applying to Cole, I had had no exposure whatsoever to engineering. Um, I actually, in my application, discussed a quilt I had sewn because I, I really enjoy sewing. Um, and, you know, people wouldn't necessarily couple that with engineering but it's got a lot of similar practices um, and I guess like problem solving creativity lots of those elements so I think if you do have those experience sure include them and they're really valuable but if you don't learn, do not let that stop you from um, applying and kind of think broadly about the types of experiences that might be relevant because things like sewing um, are really applicable I guess the second thing is just when you are kind of uh, applying to really think about your why. I know I said this before, but communicate not only why engineering, but why specifically chemical or mechanical engineering and why specifically co-op, like uh, I guess getting down to the nitty gritty of why specifically you're interested in that discipline is something that can set you apart from other applicants that perhaps talk a bit more generally. Karen, can I just jump in on that one? Yeah, I of course. The, I think the... the um, Perhaps the best advice that I can give you, and it's really the girls have said it in their indirect ways, and that is it's not so much what you've done, it's what you've learnt or, what, or how you've grown and developed from what you've done. It could be anything. Isabella's example is perfect, showing a quilt. One of the best engineering applications I ever read was about building a chicken coop. Um, now, um, why is it? Because A, there was passion in the words, but it was all about what was learnt from what you did. So it doesn't matter what it is. It can be as simple or as broad or diverse as Lauren said. Um, it's, it's about what you've learnt uh, and what it shows about you and your passions. And I think that's the best advice we can give any of you. And don't try and answer, don't try and tell us what you think we want to know. Tell us about you because that's really what we want to know and that makes you stand out. Um, if you tell us what you think we want to know, there'll be a lot of similar answers. Doesn't stand out. Tell us about you. Thanks, Kay. Um, so we have another question, probably a bit more about the nitty gritty of the application process. Um, so around how many scholarships uh, you're allowed to apply for and is it a maximum, you know, given UAC. So with the scholarship program application, you get to put down three preferences. Um, so I think sort of the key themes that have come through tonight 
choose your your preferences should be the things that you're passionate about what you enjoy what interests you what, what you're passionate about so include those and like Isabella said include why specifically those preferences from a UAC application perspective um, you do have the chance to sort of change your UAC preferences so if you are offered a UNSW scholarship um, then you need to make sure that at least one of your preferences on um, as part of UAC includes one of the co-op degrees um, but I, from my experience it's best practice to make sure that you have at least one by the time that you're applying um, just to show that you are interested like we said you know there are lots of options there are lots of choices out there it's sort of just making sure that you're doing something that you're passionate about and showing the people that you're applying for that you are passionate about that. Um, not a question, but um, um, a compliment that someone said, thank you so much for everyone and that everyone's answers uh, were insightful. Um, given we are sort of running a bit over time, I might end it with the compliment. <laughs> if there are any questions um, that we haven't answered that maybe have popped up a few times, what we might do, like we've mentioned in some other sessions, is just put together maybe an FAQ um, and just answer those. If there's sort of any more process questions, then what we'll do is send through some links from our website. Um, just to make it a bit more accessible. Um, but again, I'd like to thank Kay, uh, Stephanie, Isabella and Lauren for joining me tonight and virtually Tyler, Natalia. Um, and thank you so much for all the students who have attended tonight. I hope tonight has been helpful. Um, we'll aim to get you the links and all the recordings probably early to mid next week. Um, but otherwise I might end it there. Thank you so much to everyone. <laughs>